away at the thought that his brother has just made a world premiere on Safari Live. Jade, you're wondering if I've ever seen a leucistic giraffe. Um, I have not seen a leucistic giraffe. It's you know, it's, that's for those of you who don't know, that means a very sort of pale coloured one, um, in the same way that the white lions of the Timbavati, etc., are leucistic. Um, it just means there's a slight lack of pigment, and they're almost albino, but not quite. Um, I have never seen that. Um, I'm constantly amazed, though, I've got to tell you, about how many people ask about albino and leucistic and different color morphs of animals. It's really interesting. Um, what I think you sh might take note of with giraffe, though, is that they are far more variable in their coats than many other animals. So although, you know, if you find a leucistic lion, it's very clearly obvious that it's leucistic, you know, it's that much more pale. Um, but here, of course, on these animals, at least, oh, sorry, the radio distracted me completely there. Um, you'll find that the, some giraffe are, look almost leucistic because they're really pale, and sometimes they look a lot sort of darker and where you might even consider them being melanistic. The most hilarious example of leukism I've ever seen was with the Franklin. There was a Natal Franklin at the place I used to work and in fact I think it was in the, what it, in their covey they used to produce a sort of leukistic chick every so often. And so the gene obviously ran somewhere in that covey between the two adults. And it was this little white feather ball. And I don't think any of them survived very long because they stood out like little sort of snowball beacons. And they would be <laughs> devoured, I suspect, by the nearest Gabar goshawk at its earliest convenience. Now, Teresa, you want to know if there's a height difference between male and female giraffe. There is indeed a height difference between male and female giraffe. Um, unsurprisingly for mammals, the males are taller than the females. And I'll tell you precisely what that size range is. Uh, because I can't... Fergus, you're right. Mm. Fergus just had a bit of a sneeze there, everybody. Because I've attempted a compressed sneeze. All right, we're going to talk about going into the leopard sighting now. Um, their height is roughly for the males um, one second oh, yeah, hold on a second mass to total height uh, males can get up to five meters so males five meters tall and females 4.1 meters tall which is pretty tall really Well, so that is a 900 millimeter difference. Tammy in Ohio, you're wondering how many giraffe are in this reserve. I, it's impossible to say. I don't know how many there are on the Kruger. Um, and because they move around a lot, they're not territorial. It's quite difficult to tell how many there are. And they're nomadic, you know, they move in and out of the area. Sorry, I'm just going to get on the radio here and again. Excuse me one second. Sorry, Mike, confirm that there is now space in the Tundi sighting. Okay, copy that. Right, sounds like we can go in towards the leopard sighting, everybody. So I think we're going to just try and clear up the confusion and head that way. Let's see what we can find. We're probably about five or six minutes away. 
So let's head across to Tristan and get find out what's happening with his lion tracks. I'm going to try and find the leopard sighting. Well, James, as we said earlier, the lions have crossed into Simambili, so no chance of that. I believe there's also tracks for two male lions um, that went north into Manjaleti, so it's all rather busy. I'm just waving to some of the guys that I know from Simambili that are just coming past me now. So Sips and Service who work there, obviously colleagues of mine when I was there, so always nice to say hello. But we are now checking the sort of southern boundary area just to see really if there's any sign of shadow and, and cub or Hosanna, Shungile, any of these leopards that could be hanging around. It's worth just going to have a look. Also going to probably pop past Treehouse Dam and just see if our old buffalo bull is still there or if there's any sign of any elephants. It'd be really still good to catch up with Fang's herd. I have still trying to find them but it's difficult their last tracks went towards Arethusa and I think they might have gone on to Arethusa itself um, and crossed out that way and so once they that way it's really tough for us to find them so hopefully she'll make an appearance at some stage in the next few days somewhere around here and we can then see how she's doing I'm sure she's fine like I say if she was really in trouble and had something had happened to her we would have found a situation where there would have been a carcass reported and there would have been vultures and all those kind of things which we haven't seen even though yesterday was cold and windy it was still very sort of sunny and that means that it would have meant vultures would have been flying quite a bit yesterday particularly with that sunshine and wind it would have actually made it quite easy for them to get around so we found they would have been moving around and <clears throat> definitely somebody would have come across that so she's not ill enough that she's got any problems like that but hopefully she's just not in any discomfort at this stage and that that kind of whole scenario that played out the other day has played itself out completely and she is now back to being her normal self well I hope that's the case anyway now let's just check here this is always a good place to look for any tracks as they come from little Gauri side no it really is interesting though just to have seen the kind of change in the royal cubs we I mean we used to see Shungila and Hosanna fairly regularly in all these areas and as the days have gone by it's become harder and harder to find them they seem to kind of come in and out all the time at night but not really spending too much time here and I don't know what it could be the cause of that we know Tandi and Tamba have spent a bit of time here as well which maybe is sort of why they're spending more time to the south there's very few leopards in the south and on Hoffmans or that area that could potentially chase them there's really only shadow on Hoffmans but she's in this northwest corner so there's no one that sits south of them and maybe that's why there's just a lot more kind of going on up the side um, but it's strange because it's not like we've had heavy lion presence here that would push them southwards we haven't had the wild dog spending a lot of time here that would also push them south so it's not like there's that much pressure and I'm surprised at just how little we've seen of them over the last sort of two weeks it could be that they're finding a food source south of us that's very easy and and in some of the pans there that are drying out maybe they are utilizing that as a as a method of survival but it would be really nice if they decided to come and started spending a little bit more time back this side again. Now, we're going to go towards Treehouse Dam, see if maybe, just maybe, one of them is not there. And while we do that, let's go across to Jamie, who must be relishing the sunrise as she walks along this morning. That I definitely am, especially because when the sun rises, it does give us a really beautiful view of the spider webs that we see out here, particularly on a morning like this morning when there's actually quite a lot of moisture in the air and it creates this beautiful lit up effect. Now by now, I think most of you know exactly which spider this is. It is our tent web spider and he or she, I think she probably, is tucked away underneath the tent sort of roof part if you can imagine it like that she's I don't want to break her web but she's underneath that big pile of debris the exoskeletons of a previous kills that she's made that basically acts as well as a good point to secure her web and because I've got this viewpoint I've actually had a chance to examine the web in a way that I haven't really in the past and what's interesting is there's a network of sort of, I guess, a catchment web along the outside, away from the tent structure itself. There's a sort of a network of 
blocks that are about a centimeter squared, roughly. Obviously, they're not all even, but they're about a centimeter squared in area, all the way up and around the tent structure. And then the tent structure itself, oh, sorry, girl, just whacked her web. The tent structure itself, the, the blocks that she's made with her web, are about a millimeter squared. So it's this very, very fine, almost like a mesh of the web. She, she's basically created a mesh. And I don't, it's such a fascinating approach because the catchment web, nothing's actually going to enter into the mesh part unless it's very, very small. Everything else is going to get caught by the catchment and sort of support web that's on the outside. It's really interesting. She also has a few unwelded by them, even though they've got the most potent... Good morning, sir. Morning is the perfect morning to watch something beautiful and... James has got a glorious leopard on a termite mound.